Hello there. It has been a while. Um, now this most to do because I started my summer job and well, it's a bit more demanded than I expected it to be. But I'm back and hopefully I'm back to stay and I'll try to post videos more constantly. But today I'm bringing to you a video about closures. So to start off, what is a closure? I like to think of closures as a structure that's similar to functions but that it only makes sense within the narrow context that it's defined. Um, and although it's pretty similar, there's a couple of key differences. For example, closures can infer um, types of the parameters. So you don't have to specify that you're passing in a U32 or a UA or whatever, it infers based on context. And closures can also capture the environment. Um, if some of this doesn't make much sense to you. Don't worry, we'll go over a couple of examples and I'm sure it'll be clear then. Okay, so when I say that closures are similar to functions, what do I mean? So right here, I have a function called add one, which receives x and outputs x plus one. So if we wanted to do this with closures, the way that we'll do it is we'll say let, we'll give it a name, I'll call it add one closure. Now you use these, I think these are called pipes and uh, curly brackets. In here you'll pass an x, in here you'll just say x plus one. Now in this case, because we only have uh, one expression, we can even remove the curly brackets and it looks like this. Now, if we just say call a print line, just to print whatever this looks like and say add closure, We'll pass in one for two, so we should output one for three. If we run this, so just cargo run, you'll see that we get one for three. Okay, so this is the basic structure. If you have more uh, expressions, as I said, you use, use curly brackets and note that we didn't infer the type. Well, I mean, it did infer the type, so we didn't explicitly say the type. And well, in this case, we're not capturing the environment, but yeah, so this is how they're similar. But there's something to watch out for uh, when inferring types. And to exemplify, I've modified this a bit. I, instead of calling it add one closure, I'm just calling it example closure and it's just returning X. Not the most useful closures, but it will display the idea quite nicely. So let's just say that we want to create a variable called S where we're gonna call example closure on say, okay to string. Okay, so in here, the compiler will understand that this closure was built for strings. Now, let's pass in, say, an int. We'll just say example closure, and we'll pass in um, uh, one. What do you think will be the output of this code? Pause the video and think a little bit. Okay, so assuming you're back, and let's now just run it. And you'll see that in here, it says expected struct string found integer. So you can think what's going through the compiler's mind. It's seeing this closure. It's seeing that it's being used of strings. And then right below, it's being used of an integer. It's like, oh, that's not the type that I inferred. So it throws an error. And yeah, so that's just something to watch out for. If you want to be extra clear, something you can do is you can actually define the type so you can say string this time you're not putting anything up to chance and you're saying that you'll only be using strings here so then even if you were to just say let i and that cargo run it you'll see that we still get the error okay this is not necessary compiler usually infers the type but if you want to be extra clear for say you're i don't know delivering or writing your own crate and you're going to be clear you can you can do this just fine Okay, so what do I mean when I say that closures can capture their environment? Let's play around a bit. I define this variable called x, and in here I'll create a function called OK. Um, now in here I'm just going to return x. Now note, I'm not passing in x as a parameter. I'm just returning x. Okay. And in here I will print line um, x. Oh, sorry, not X. I'll print line OK. Now, what do you think will happen? 
let's just run it and see what the compiler tells us. Um, can't capture dynamic environment in function item. And now the compiler is nice enough to tell us, tell us that we should use closures instead. So let's do that. Um, instead of this being a function, let's say let. Okay, let's remove parentheses and put in our pipes. Now we'll return x and in here we'll just, oops, a semicolon here, yeah. And now let's run it. So if we cargo run, we get one. Now, as a, I guess, seasoned Rustachian, you should be asking yourself, okay, but what happened to X? And that's what we're gonna answer next. All right, so before we enter what happened to our friend X, let's turn it into a string, because things are always more fun with strings. And in here, I don't know, we'll say concatenate with IE this string. This way it turns our OKs into OKs. And yeah, in here we'll just print line. So just to display that it's working, let's just cargo run it. And oops, I've added the semicolon so it's not returning anything. Let's just cargo run it. And you see we see that we get OK. Nice. Now what is happening to X? I think the best and the quickest way to test this is just to call OK again. Let's see what's happen well, let's see what happens. So if we do this, we will get an error telling us that the value was moved here and the value was used here after move. So this OK closure is taking ownership of our X variable. Okay, so we can we can no longer use it. It consumes X. Right, so that's that's what's happening in this case. But closures they implement three types of no implement three traits which define um, how it handles its uh, cap capturing its environment. So that's what we'll discuss next. Okay, so the example we just saw is of a closure that implements a trait called fn once. Once because, well, it can only be ran once. Otherwise, um, it causes an error because the closure is consuming its environment. Um, another trait that it can implement is one called fn. And it looks like this. So we've gone back to having integers. And in here, we'll just have x1 and we'll return x1 plus 2. And just to show you that the variable is still there, I'm printing x1 afterwards. So if we just cargo run it, um, we get nothing because I didn't save it. So if we just cargo run it, we get three and then one. So returned and then we still have it here. It was just a immutable borrow. Now the last type we can have of a closure capturing its environment is for a closure that implements fn mute which means this is uh, that's receiving a mutable variable and you can change it with it. Now one thing to note is that now currently this will not compile. We have to say mute in here. Okay, so mutable. Now again, this is a mutable bore because we get x2 and we can change it. So in here, if everything goes according to plan, we should see that this is now two. So, oops, sorry. So if we run this, cargo run it, we'll get okay, three, one, and then we get two and two. Okay, so it added one, and then x2 became two because it was a mutable bar. So those are the three ways that a closure can capture its environment. And now a quick aside, the move keyword. Now say let me bring a new example and the scope this guy so we have a mutable variable x3 which is a vector uh one two three and we have this um closure which just pops a variable out of x3 so pop it will return the variable soul 
in, in this case, pop will remove three, and so the closure will output uh, three. But well, it puts it inside of a an option enum, so it'll be sum three. Okay, so in this case, I'll put sum three, and here we'll have the vector, so one and two without the three because it popped out. So let me just cargo run it. And I didn't save it. I usually don't. So let's just cargo run it again. And we get sum three and one two. Now, this is of course an example of an FN mute because we're getting a mutable, this is a mutable, and we're editing X3. What if I didn't want it to be? Okay, what if I wanted it to consume X3? That's when the move keyword comes into play. So in here, I can say move. And now if we run it back, you see that uh, move occur. And then it cannot be borrowed here after move. Quick thing I want to note is if I try to print this before calling OK3, you will note that we still get the error. That's because the move occurs right here. Okay, so here already x3 um, has already been consumed. Okay, so yeah, that was a quick aside. And just to finish off, um, I think one of the big, I guess, points of talking about fn mute and fn and fn fn once is to utilize closures in structs. So a bit of a homework to you. I encourage you to try to implement a struct and have one of its fields be a closure. You can either implement fn once, fn, or fn mute. And I don't know, try things out. Have fun and then post your questions in the comments below. I'll be happy to help with all the hurdles that you get through. But the video is getting a bit long, so I'll stop right here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.